Welcome into another edition of Trust the Process Recorded, um, because we'll be coming back at you live just as soon as all of this pandemic has uh, kind of blown over and we're allowed back in our studio. But I am James Hyde, your host. We got Mr. Five Digits, Max Coolish, Mr. Uh, James Jackson over here. And you might recognize this man from another one of our flagship programs, but we have the one and only Seth Joyner joining us this week. How are you doing, sir? All good, man. All good. How you guys doing through all this quarantine nonsense? Getting by. What's the word we use? What's the word we use, Jim? Surviving. Surviving. We're surviving. I had I had a B plus weekend, maybe a B. Um, that's where I'll grade it out. But I can tell by even just glancing through Twitter that a lot of Eagles fans may grade their weekend a little bit lower on the uh, the A to F scale. Shaky, baby. Yeah, a, little, a little shaky, but that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, this is this is Trust the Process, very special draft edition. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. And while it might not have been the pick that everybody is up in arms about, there was still a little bit of hesitation and backlash to the first round pick. With the first round choice of the Eagles, they go ahead and select the speedy wide receiver out of TCU, Jalen Rager. It's there were still options left on the board. They could have gone different ways in the positions that they need to fill. So, Seth, I'm going to ask you first: Was Jalen Rager the the right guy to take in the first round? Um, when you really think about it, us looking on the outside, uh, what we do is we listen to the mock draft 101s, 202s, 303s, you know, for like three months leading up to the draft. And these guys have got all these receivers ranked according to what they believe and what they where they think they should be drafted. So when you look at a Jalen Rager, no one had him ranked above um, Justin Jefferson. I think everyone was hoping that the Philadelphia Eagles, that, that Justin Jefferson would fall to them. And he actually fell right to him, and they leapt over him. Now, let's talk about C.D. Lamb for a second, because C.D. Lamb is, is, falls all the way to 17 to the Cowboys, and I can bet you whatever it is that you want to bet that the Cowboys had no intentions whatsoever of drafting a wide receiver until one of the top wide receivers, if not the top wide receiver, falls to them at 17. An opportunity for them to thumb their nose back at the Eagles for the Eagles two years ago, jumping over them and taking Goddard before they could get to him. Yep. Um, it has definitely made their wide receiver core better. But getting back to, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles, um, when teams are, are grading their wide receivers, everyone has it in their mind where these guys fit organizationally. And they don't mean the same thing to one team as they mean to another. So, whether they got the right guy or not, you know, we can debate that all day. But obviously, Harry Roseman and um, Doug Peterson and the rest of the Eagles organization felt as though this was their guy rather than them going with Justin Jefferson. Seth, I, I got a question for you real quick. This is a uh, – I don't want to call it a theory because I think this is probably pretty true. With all the, the workouts and all the pre-draft stuff going virtual this year, there's no real opportunity for the other front office executives to mingle and, you know, spitball ideas. So what I think happens, and this seems to be a pretty, you know, widely, you know, accepted thing that this definitely at least influenced how things went. Teams are really sticking to their own guns and, and how he kind of always has gone his own, you know, separate path. I feel like he kind of does his own thing a little bit more often than the average you know, GM or front office executive in a drafting position would. But I feel like this year maybe kind of amplified it where, you know, we end up with a guy like Jalen Rager who a lot of people didn't, you know, know about as the potential pick at 21 because he's not a name like Justin Jefferson. But that's the thing. You, you hit it on the head with the mock drafts. On, you know, with all the mock drafts people read, they see Justin Jefferson as the fourth guy coming off the board all the time. But what happens when, you know, the franchise that's picking doesn't value him, you know, as a, you know, as a position or the, the way that he plays as the fourth best receiver. So I, I just want to see, do you, do you think that, you know, NFL executives not being able to talk to each other, do you think that played a, you know, big part in a small part, any part at all. I'm just curious. From a, a I'm part. I'm not so sure that executives being able to you know congregate and, and chat as much as they normally do really had a whole lot to do with it. I think that every team has their draft. You know, they they've got their their scouting department. Um, they've got their staff that's in place that's responsible for you know previewing these players and 
interviewing these players at the combine and compiling all the data and throwing all the analytics that go along with it to it. And I just think that every team looks at each and every player and they create a dra a, a grade for that player. Um, and when it comes time to make your selection, a lot of times it will come down to what your philosophy is as an organization. Are you an organization that drafts for need? And in my opinion, teams draft for need when you're like on the cusp of a Super Bowl and you need a specific position addressed. Now you, dra you, you, you draft for need. But if you're an organization that's building, um, you, you take the best available. And when you're dealing with best available, there's no, you know, there's no telling what a team may do because everybody values each and every player on a different level. It, that, that's just factual. You know, Howie Roseman, I promise you, did, did not value Justin Jefferson along the same lines as, say, a Joe Douglas for the New York Jets, you know, probably did. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge issue and a huge thing to deal with on draft night because that reflects players that you draft or players that you pass over or players that you even consider throughout that 10 to 15 minute process. And teams definitely stuck to their like their specific yeah. draft board way more this year. Um, and, so James, what do you, what do you think about this Rager? Play? Well, I mean, this is kind of where my head was with it. And Seth, you feel, feel free to obviously jump in. I, I kind of want to know what you think about this Testament, but to me, I, this is what I think the Eagles and what Harry Roseman did. I think they're, evaluating all the picks that could possibly get to them. And then realistically, they're looking at their position at 21 and saying, probably these are the receivers that are going to fall to us. I don't think they're expecting receivers like CeeDee Lamb to fall or Justin Jefferson to fall all the way down to 21. So we say like, yes, I would love to have those guys, but realistically, I think a guy like Jalen Rieger is going to be in our grasp. And then the more you further evaluate a guy like Jalen Rieger, the more you do your homework on him, you start to, you almost fall in love with the pick. Like you've done so much research on him, making sure that maybe this is going to be going to have to be the guy we're going to pick because Justin Jefferson may not be there. That when it comes down time to it, we've done so much research on Jalen Rieger. We've almost kind of started to value him more than Justin Jefferson because we didn't think Justin Jefferson was going to be here. So I think that's almost maybe what could have happened in that draft room. And then when it came down to it, we're still going to pick Jalen Rieger. But when you ask the question, James, is Jalen Rieger the right pick? you know, at, at that 21 in the first round. A lot of people have tried to sense make this pick, try to figure out why did we pick Jalen Rieger? Oh, it's because we're going to, you know, do this with him. We're going to use him in a different way than we would use Justin Jefferson. And people have tried to have to make reasons about it. And I think that's what makes him the wrong pick for the first round. I think, I don't think your first round pick, you should have to try to, you know, come up and conjure reasons as to why your team took him. I think your first round draft pick should be, you know, he was there because he addresses a need. He makes our team better. And when I'm looking at a first-round pick, I'm looking at a guy to come in and contribute immediately and have an impact on the football field right away. I don't, I don't think Jalen Rieger has that immediate impact as much as Justin Jefferson would, able, you know, would be able to have that immediate impact. And if you look at the, the past and the history of the Eagles drafting at the wide receiver position, it hasn't been the greatest. There, there hasn't been that many successes in recent memory drafting at receiver. So to me, why make that even more complicated? Why, why do that to yourself again? I go back to the, the point that Seth made with the best available. If I haven't had great success in recent drafts at a position and I'm going in to this next draft knowing that's my number one priority, why complicate it? Why make the process harder for myself? If the best available is there, get the best available at that position so I can make my wide receiver core better. So that's why I have a little bit of trouble with the Jalen Rager pick. I like him as a player. He has great skill sets. And he's going to add great speed to that receiver position. But I'm looking at the overall best pick, and I think the overall best pick would have been Justin Jefferson, if I'm being completely honest. Hey, listen, I, I, I get what you're saying, and it's all valid. But the Eagles, from a draft perspective, and their philosophy is flawed now and for the future if that is what ruled in their decision to make this draft pick, that they tried to project who was going to be available to them and in the process, they fell in love with a, with a Jalen Rager because they thought that that was the guy that was going to fall to them. You know, by the time they got to pick 14, 15 in this first round, in my opinion, 
really Howie right. should have been burning the phone lines up and that entire mindset should have shifted all over again. Why? Because CeeDee Lamb was right there for the taking. Why didn't we move up? Because he didn't want to lose that 53rd pick? Because according to what you're saying, they've already predetermined that they're going to take Jalen Hurts at 53 if he was there? <laughs> Come on, man. You can't, you, you can't approach drafts in that yeah. manner. It's a fluid situation, and you have to treat it as such. If I was the GM, by the time we got to 12 or 13 and I saw C.D. Lamb sliding and sliding and sliding, I would have been burning the phone lines up, you know, at, 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 at picks 14, 15, and 16, okay, to move up and get him. Because here's a guy that should have went in the top five or six picks that lasted until 17 at a position of need that you needed. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that, that just doesn't fly. I mean, you, you can't be that inflexible as an organization that you fall in love with a, with a player that you presume may fall to you at a, at, a, at a specific spot because you don't have any idea what the other, what the other 20 picks are going to wind up being. Mm -hmm. So you got to be flexible and, and fleet of foot enough to be able to say, okay, let's, let's adjust what we thought. And I get it, you know, it's virtual. You got all of those things going on. But you had, what, the Super Bowl was what, January, February 3rd? You have from February 3rd to um, April 23rd, 24th, and 25th to figure this damn thing out. That's, uh, James, that's actually a very interesting point about how, because we all know Howie Roseman likes to feel like he outsmarts everybody. Um, that that seems to be a general consensus on how he likes to feel but it's a very interesting point about almost overselling yourself on someone because you've done so much work into into projecting them and seeing how they would fit um that kind of leads into what seth was saying in teams that are on the cusp draft for need so what doesn't make sense to me is isn't this kind of a team that wants to extend a playoff window so wouldn't you think that most of these picks wouldn't be projects and developmental kind of players, and you're trying to fill needs. So that, that kind of leads us into our next, next question is, with so many clearly defined needs, why didn't the Eagles go there? And, and what positions did we neglect, Seth? Like, are, are there any clear holes on this roster that they just did not address at all? Well, I, I will say this. Um, Jalen Rager was a head scratcher because you had Justin Jefferson sitting right there. But only time will tell. Because, listen, he could come into Philadelphia and outplay a Justin Jefferson from a production standpoint for the Eagles. That's all that matters. Right. You know, but only time will tell. Because we don't know right now what Justin Jefferson is going to be for the, for the Minnesota Vikings. And we don't know what Jalen Rager is going to be for the Philadelphia Eagles. So only time will tell how this, how this plays out. It hasn't been good throughout history for the Eagles when there was a guy there that we could have taken or should have taken that we didn't, and someone else wound up picking him, and then he turns into our world, and we're sitting there looking, this is what we got, but that's what we could have had. As, as fans, that's part of integral part of our, of our history. The other thing is when you look at, um, Jalen Hurts, that's another, even, that's an even bigger head scratcher, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. Make but when, sense. and I'm sure you guys want to get into that, but once you move past that number two pick, how he slot, he slayed it, man. He mm -hmm. slayed it. I mean, he got speed all across the board to trade for Marquise Goodwin. I mean, you literally have a four by one, you know, team at your wide receiver position. The linebackers, the two linebackers, Javion Taylor, speed, aggression. Then I, you know, I coached the kid from Temple um, in the um, NFL PA um, Collegiate Bowl game out in Pasadena. Sean Bradley, a lot of skill sets. I think they got better at that position. They addressed their needs from a cornerback position and free agency, um, which is going to create a lot more competition on the other side. They got some depth on the, you know, on the offensive line. Um, I, I guess the only 
area, and they tried to address that in the seventh round with the Two Hill kid from um, from from Stanford. From Stanford, yeah. Is the you know depth on the defensive line, you know, and and who knows because we don't know what he's going to turn into at defensive end. Listen, you need someone out there to continue to push the envelope of competition to get these guys to either rise up or get on out of here. And let's try to find somebody, you know, who can who can actually get the job done. But I felt like, you know, once we got past the second second round, how we just absolutely, you know, put the hammer down, man. And and to your point, Seth, how we probably thinks he did address a need in that second round. To, to how we and a lot of people in and around the Eagles, backup quarterback might have been a need. And that's, I guess, a whole different conversation as to whether you guys or whether you personally think backup quarterback is a need for the Eagles. But to Howie, that might have been something that, that he addressed. Let me, let me step on the brakes right there with that <laughs> assumption. Please do. Please. It's not an assumption. I, 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 it's not an assumption. I, I, I'm looking at, I'm I, looking I at what this. happened. Okay, but if, if that is a position of need, you mean to tell me you're going to go and get – a rookie quarterback and bring him in to back up your franchise quarterback. And if he gets hurt and the team, let's say the team is like, you know, eight and one Mm -hmm. and Jalen Hurts has got to take over. He's going to get us to the promised land. Then why did he do it? Then then why did he spend a 50 of the number 53 pick on Jalen Hurts? If that's the reason, why did he do it? I am scratching my head. There there is no reason. There is no reason. I I think so are they. You know, because <laughs> Doug, Doug Peterson said, hey, you know, um, we got some things that we want to do with him along the lines of what the Saints do with Taysom Hill. Well, the Saints the Saints picked Taysom Hill up on the waiver wire. Yeah. They did they grab him pick pick on him, yeah. Okay. And then Howie, in his assertion that, oh, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're a quarterback factory. We're, we're – drafting and developing. Man, you ain't drafted. The only quarterback that you drafted and developed is Carson Wentz. I can go right. through a list of names, okay? All right? You drafted Thorson last year. He didn't even make the roster. You got four years invested in Nate Sudfeld. This drafting basically says that Nate Sudfeld ain't the guy, and you ain't getting a return on investment on him after four years of investing in him, okay? Shall I go on? Barkley. I mean, I can go through a whole myriad of guys, Mm -hmm. you know, so this whole theory that we're addressing and we're building quarterbacks for what? I mean, did you draft this guy so that you can develop him to turn him into down the road draft capital? If that's why you did it, then just come out and say that that's why you did it. But there is no logical reason why you draft a rookie quarterback in the second round with the 53rd pick to come in and back up your franchise quarterback. There are enough veterans on the, on the street right now that you could assign to come in and say that, you know, if the chips are down and the season's on the line and we lose our franchise quarterback, that we know this guy can step in right now and get the job done. You know, now on speak for yourself this morning, we talked about this and Jason Whitlock's position was, Hey, that wasn't the case with Lamar Jackson. That wasn't the case with Patrick Mahomes. That wasn't the case with Russell Wilson. Those guys are the anomalies, okay? That only happens every once in a while. Patrick Mahomes won a Super Bowl in his third year. Lamar Jackson exploded in his second year. Russell Wilson won a Super Bowl in his second year. But he wasn't the, the driving factor as to why they won the Super Bowl. They had one of the most dominant defenses in the history of the league that won them the Super Bowl, okay? So you're going to sell me on the fact that Jalen Hurts is going to come in here and back up Carson Wentz, and if Carson Wentz gets hurt, he's going to take us to the, to the promised land? I think not. Those I'm sorry. Are- those other three quarterbacks that Jason Whitlock named came in in very different situations than Jalen Hurts is coming in with the Eagles. Very different. One of them had Carson Wentz in front very, of them. Very different. Lamar Jackson came in when Joe Flacco was a million years old and on his way out. All of them were placed underachieving 30 plus year old franchise like, quarterbacks. It's, it's not. It's really it's different story. Nowhere near. Not, like, not you're, you're gonna, Whitlock's going to compare Matt Flynn to Carson Wentz. Come on, man. Like, Come on, man. Come on, man. That, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, Max, what, what do you think? Did, did we address all the all the clearly defined needs here or no? Um, I, I don't really want to talk about anything other than how bad I think of a decision it was to take Jalen Hurts in the <laughs> second round. And I really can't stress that enough. Uh, I know you're really loving this, James, so enjoy it. But I'm not going to lie. I'm livid over this pick. 
this is maybe the most blindsided I've ever felt by the Eagles. Mm. I'm not I'm not exaggerating here. This pick was catastrophic bad. I can't think of a worse way to spend a second round pick in such a prime draft. There were still receivers available that were up in the air for, you know, the 30 to 40 range. And we were picking at 53. You could have got another one of those receivers and not had to maybe worry about taking you know, a later pick on a receiver. Obviously, that's not how things shook out. But I think there's no, there's literally no benefit to this. Because think about it. If Hurts plays, that means Wentz is hurt. Bad situation. If, if Hurts is playing and they're giving him gadget plays, that means they're taking Wentz off the field. They're taking our best offensive player off the field to give Jalen Hurts snaps, much like the Saints do with Taysom Hill and Drew Brees. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed, but taking Drew Brees off the field, usually not a good thing for that, that offense, okay? Uh, anything else at that point is he's trade bait, he's – insurance policy to me it feels like the best thing that'll ever happen to Jalen Hurts is if he never plays a meaningful snap for the Eagles because that means we've traded him before his rookie contract expired to a team that's maybe going to give him a chance and maybe we're going to get some overpriced draft capital from it but honestly there's no positive outcome of this to me there's none because as soon as Wentz has a bad game QB controversy what if Wentz has to miss a series and, and Jalen Hurts throws two first downs QB controversy I'm not want to. I I'm, I'm going to throw this phrase out here. I don't want to see this shitstorm, honestly, because it's going to be a shitstorm, and I want no part of that. I don't want to be involved on the outside or the inside if I'm part of that organization, honestly. I, Max, Max, I I I thought when they cast off Nick Foles that they would never put themselves in this mm -hmm. situation again. Thank you. Because absolutely, you know, it, it, I don't care how much people talk about around that organization talk about how happy. Carson Wentz was for Nick Foles. Human nature tells me something different, okay? Yes. You take a team to 12 wins or 11 wins, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you get hurt, and another guy steps in and takes your team that you've played to an MVP level on, and they win the Super Bowl. And you've got to stand back and watch all of this, and you're supposed to be happy for him? Human nature says that's BS, that life doesn't work that way, okay? And he put up a front as long as he could put it up, and people talked about, oh, they should keep them both. I said there's no way they can keep them both. One has to go, and the one that has to go is Nick Foles because of what you've given up for to, to get Carson Wentz. Yeah, that's, just the, that's, that's the nature of the beast, okay? So now you've turned around by taking Jalen Hurts at 53 in the second round. Put yourself in this situation all over again. God forbid Carson Wentz gets hurt again and Jalen Hurts goes in and has success. Here we go with the Wentz haters all over again. Yep. Here we go with all of this drama all over again. Because if he plays and he plays well, you know that there are still that Nick Foles faction of fans in Philadelphia and those idiot media people across the United States of America that don't like Carson Wentz that loves Nick Foles that believes that Nick Foles was the best long-term solution for the Philadelphia Eagles they will now turn to Jalen Hurts and say the same exact thing the, the Eagles made a big this made a big mistake giving Carson Wentz all that money um they drafted Jalen Hurts as an insurance policy because they knew they couldn't trust Carson Wentz to stay healthy all of that BS that you hear is just nonsense and I cannot believe for the life of me. Now, you want a guy that's able to step in and be able to take the team, put the team on his shoulder, and drive the bus while your main guy is out, okay? That's why I said a veteran guy made more sense that you sign on, in free agency than drafting a guy in the second round and having to develop him. Okay, You're not telling me that Jalen Hurts is going to be ready in any capacity to mm -hmm. take the field this year if Carson Wentz gets hurt. No, that's no. that's an, I, I just I'm not buying that. So, I mean, yeah. even if you minimize a package, that package is going to be minimized so small that it's going to take defenses one to two weeks max before they come up with a methodology to be able to stop. Mm -hmm. So hear me out, Seth. Is there a part of Howie that wants this? Not the controversy, but the options. I mean, he. The, the saying the statement, I want, you know, we're a quarterback factory. I want to be a QB factory. is a pretty powerful statement when you have allegedly invested in your franchise quarterback. Why, why do you feel the need to be a factory? Why do you feel the need to continue to churn out good quarterback 
good quarterback product. I'm not saying that Howie Roseman wants, you know, anarchy and wants controversy looming over his organization, but does Howie Roseman want options? Does Howie Roseman never want to be in a situation where if Carson Wentz goes down, we have Josh McCown instead of Nick Foles? Like, does Howie Roseman always want the ability to, if our number one goes down, our number two and damn near maybe our number three can still move us forward? Does Howie Roseman want that? I I feel how he's paying because – when you've endured what he's endured, when Chip Kelly came in and told Jeffrey Lurie he wanted complete control, okay, and he pushed Howie to the back of the to the back of the building in a janitor's closet somewhere, and nobody knew where he was, I could understand him never wanting to be in a compromising position ever again, okay. So, whether it's a coach or a GM or the lack of talent. From a, from a player standpoint, he is never going to put himself in a situation where he falls it or fails again, okay? But even with this pick, I just, I don't see it. I don't see how this benefits this football team in any way. I don't um, either. I really and, and don't either. It, it'll take, I assume, the football season to come around for us to be able to see it. And if you don't see Jalen Hurts on the field, because at 53, that guy should be on the field contributing. Yes, if yes, you don't see him on the field, this is a, a, a problem that is going to persist on and on and on all season into next season. I don't know how long. If Carson Wentz stays help, healthy and he plays well, everybody's going to be like, why did we make this? And it's not a question that's going to go away. You know the Philly market. You know, know the Philly media. Well, they they are not going to let this die. Not going to let it die. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest. I, I was scratching my head, and I was checking my phone for a trade, like, for probably 35 to 40 minutes after this pick. I was like, oh, okay. So like, five minutes after the pick happened, I'm like, all right, you know what? They took him because another team wanted him. They're offloading him. They're getting capital back or a wide receiver or, like, a stud D lineman. I, I thought there was going to be a trade. Um, but all, all this talk kind of – it takes away half of our next question because um, I'm not going to ask you who your least favorite pick was because I'm pretty sure everybody in the Philadelphia market has the same exact uh, least favorite pick. Um, but real quick, Seth, we'll start with you. Uh, who was your favorite pick? I know you said you worked with Sean Bradley before. Who, who was the guy that you really liked in this class? Well, let, let me let me preface my answer with saying I love Jalen Hurts as a person, as a football player. I love everything about him. Right. I love the way he handled the situation in Alabama. I love the way he evolved himself and handled himself in Oklahoma. And I think that he was undervalued by a lot of teams. I think that he can be a lot better than a lot of people think. Maybe that's how we, you know, what how he's thinking. Um, but not at 53. Okay, so now who 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 is my favorite player? Um I'm impartial to Sean Bradley because I seen the kid up front. Um and I can remember, you know, pre-draft there was some some chatter on Twitter that the Eagles were interested in, and I tweeted out, I hope that the Eagles draft this kid because of what he brings to the table. Ooh. After looking at video on Davian Taylor. I like what he brings to the table. He's a short tackler, um, very smart, very active, very physical. And Sean Bradley brings some of the same, you know, attributes. Um, If Jim Schwartz isn't in love with any of the guys that he has at linebacker right now, I can perceive and I can see these two guys being starters at some point. I'm not sure that that will absolutely work out. But at the end of the day, that's how much I love those two picks. I'm impartial because I'm a linebacker. And we haven't had a playmaking linebacker in Philadelphia since William Thomas. Come on, man. That's been forever ago. Now, I'm not talking about we haven't had good linebackers. Right. You know, Jeremiah Trotter, great linebacker. No doubt about it. Tackling machine. Okay. Michael Kendricks, supremely talented. Ernie Sims supremely talented, but could never find their footing, okay? Jordan Hicks, poised to be a superstar. Glass Joe, couldn't stay healthy, okay? But when I look at these two guys, these two guys are playmakers. They have the opportunity, and that's the difference. It's one thing to, like, make a boatload of tackles. It's another thing to be a playmaker, 
I'm talking about interceptions, sacks, strip fumbles, recovered fumbles. Um, you name plays to help change the outcome of the game. That's, you know, when you're talking about a linebacker, especially in this 4-2 scheme that we find ourselves in now, teams aren't 3-4 or 4-3 anymore. They are basically 4-2. You better have two hell raises in the middle, and you better have at least one guy that's a straight-out playmaker. And if you don't have that, you don't have a shot and defensively, in my, in my opinion, in the NFL. He said, I want another Seth Joyner in my, in my linebacking club. I, I mean, uh, I they, damn sure they, do. Broke, they broke that mold, bro. <laughs> no, hey, no, nobody's going to hit as hard as you, Seth, but they, uh, they might be able to cover because that, that kid out of Colorado, he sure can fly around that field. Both uh, of Mac, them. I mean, hey, James, both of them guys can run. Oh, yeah. You know, they're, they're both on the small side. That's the only thing that worries me about them. My, my, my opinion to them would be get in the weight room and bulk up, get you about 10 to 12 pounds on if you can. You know, and, and they're so fast that even if they bulk up a little bit, that they're not going to lose their speed. Right. But that exactly. Davion Taylor kid, man, he can Fly. run like a safe. You can man. teach Fly. kid to lift, but you can't teach him how to be faster. Yeah. Right. Can't, no. teach speed. can't teach speed. Can't teach speed. Uh, Max, what's a, give, me, give me your favorite pick real quick. One, one guy that stands out that you loved. Uh, I'll flip a coin. I'll go, I'll go Kayvon Wallace because he's got the backing of another Eagles defensive legend in B-Doc, and that's hard to not get excited over. Honestly, I'll, I'll keep it franchise short. love safeties out of Clemson. Mm-hmm. He 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 talks the talk already. He's got the swagger. Like he he seems like the kind of guy that can become a leader of a of a team and a defense ultimately. Uh, he, he's I'm, be, I'm, I'm excited to see if he'll get there. He's going to be a big pickup for them because if Agreed. you really study what he does, he's highly versatile. And when I watch him play, believe it or not, you know who he reminds me of. That he is. reminds me of Malcolm Jenkins, man. I knew oh, you were gonna, there it is. I knew you were going to say Malcolm. I knew you were going to say Malcolm. There it is. I mean, hey, a lot of people are going to love to hear that. He likes to patrol but, the line of scrimmage just like Malcolm. He's a little more physical than Malcolm. I mean, he comes up and he will lay the wood on you. He's a good from, hitter. From a versatility standpoint, I mean, he can play halves. He can play in the hole. He can drop down in the box. He can cover tight ends. Um, he can do a lot of things. And I think, you know, that's that – that's that utility mm. toolbox that they that they were missing by losing Malcolm, um, but I think they replaced it, and it it will all depend on how quickly he can pick up on all the facets of the defense and how versatile he becomes to Jim Schwartz in play calling situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, real quick before before we get to James, I just I just have a gut feeling, you know, comes from a winning program, he knows what it takes to be great. I have a feeling that even rookie year, he's going to be one of those guys where the coaching staff finds a way to get him on the field for plays because of what he shows them, you know, at practices and in the film room and stuff like that. Like I have a feeling by you know halfway through the season, he's going to be demanding snaps because of you can't keep this guy off the field. He's too good. Max, I guess, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and I don't, I, I don't like to, I don't like to step on people's opinions, but I'm not a big, big proponent of guys. Okay, he came from a winning program. Or like everybody always likes to talk about all oh, his pedigree. Pedigree and coming from a winning program doesn't mean anything if it doesn't come from here and you don't have it here. When I watch that kid play, he's hungry. You know, I know because I came from a losing program, you know, in college. My drive was that, you know what, hey, I am sick and tired of losing my entire football career. And my dream is on the line as an eighth round draft pick. When you have those things, then pedigree and coming from a winning program means a bag of rocks to me. Um, I would much rather see that that guy has that fire in him. Along the things that Howie deemed were important in this draft, is he speed? Does he have speed? Is he healthy? Okay. And does he love football? And when you watch that kid play, he possesses all three of those elements. Okay, fair enough. James, who you got? You know, Max actually stole mine. I was going to say, you know, if I was an Eagles fan, I'd probably be happiest with Kevon Wallace for, for, I mean, all the, the, all the reasons you two both laid out. But especially, you know, Seth, when you're talking about his versatility, he can even drop him down and play a little bit of nickel corner if, if you wanted him to. And Jim Schwartz, I mean, we all know Jim Schwartz runs a very complex style of defense. It's, it's not, not an easy scheme 
to run. And what helps that is when you have players who can be used in, like you said, in, in multifacets, very versatile, you know, very versatile players, very utility belt players. So that's one. My, my second one, if I had to choose another one, would probably be Jack Driscoll, uh, adding you know, some depth to that offensive line. I got another very versatile guy on that offensive line. He's played left tackle. He's played right guard. He's actually was – I heard he was working out a lot at center too, um, you know, in, in the pre-draft process. I know the center's not really a need for the Eagles, but it just shows that he can be moved all over that offensive line and used to fill, you know, holes if, if holes were to arise. And I know offensive line has been one area, another area of the Eagles that's had a little bit of uncertainty to it over recent years and getting a guy like that, adding depth uh, to that offensive line and hopefully protect your biggest asset in Carson Wentz. I think it was a, a very good pick in what was at the fourth round that they got him in. So I think, you know, that was a good pick and might be a little unsung hero of this draft class. I'll tell you what, um, you know, they, they, they picked two guys out of Auburn, two offensive linemen. Um, and this Prince Tega Wanoa, I think that, you know, he has the most versatility out of the two. I still have an issue with both of them because I went and I looked at film. The thing I don't like about Jack Driscoll, he just wants to get in the way of people. You know, I want my offensive lineman to want to chew your head off and throw it in the stands. I want you moving. You, you, the only way that you're going to be able to move, run the football is you got to move people. And all the film that I watch on these two guys they don't move anybody. They're just big bodies, and they get in the way. Um, at Jack Driscoll, to me, he just likes to kind of get in the way of pass rushers. It's not that I want to just beat you down and maul you, that kind, of, that kind of mentality. I don't know whether that can be changed. I doubt it. You know, they address the need of depth on the offensive line with these two guys. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't see in these guys that dog that you see in like a a a Brandon Brooks when Brandon Brooks is trying to is trying to to block you he's trying to embarrass you. Well, well okay now so now now we're comparing a fourth round draft pick to an all pro guard like I think Yeah but you want to know something but, but and I I'll say this you, your your point is correct and, and well taken okay but you can't go get a puppy and hope he turns into a pit bull that's just Fair. a fact Fair. okay Fair. You, I mean, if, if you go get a you you go get a Labrador, and every time he see you, he wants to lick your hand. That's a big difference, you know, from the pit bull. If you put your hand down there, he'll take your hand off. Okay. Now, if I'm if 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 I'm drafting, I want guys who want not they don't want to just take your hand off. They want to take your whole damn arm off. Mm. That's the kind of guy I want. So that mentality is either in you or it isn't in you. And that's the thing that worries me about these draft picks is when I watch them play, when I watch their film, I don't see dominant. I don't see dominance. I don't see, you know, opposing guys. I don't see guys exerting their will, you know. I mean, haven't we had enough of that with some of the guys that we've drafted, you know, over the last couple of years that, you know, they fight one week, they take another week off, they fight two weeks, they take two weeks off. No, I want a guy to just want to just maul you and beat you down every single week. Seth, I, I love that uh, that analogy. You can get a puppy, but you can't turn him into a pit bull. Uh, that's that boy, might, might be one of my favorite uh, metaphors I've heard. Unless unless he's a pit bull, unless he's a pit bull, bull puppy. Unless he's a pit bull, you know. What I mean? <laughs> hey, even, hey, pit bulls are great dogs. They can grow up to be real sweet. You know what I mean? Um, but that's so. I was also going to go with Kevon Wallace uh, mainly because you know, he, like James said, he can play a lot of nickel corner, but best fit as a safety. So to me, that eliminates the need to transfer Jalen Mills to safety. So, you know what I mean? We don't have to, you have Douglas as the nickel corner. Um, Gabon Wallace is a Swiss army knife. Seth, what do you think? Is that like, is that in the plans to kind of eliminate having to find somebody next to Darius Slay? No, I think that Jalen Mills is going to get every opportunity afforded to him to, to win the position. Um, I mean, you can't you can't expect for a you know fourth round safety to come in and expect for him to just step on the field and take the reins and be your starting safety. Not with all the things that they do. Um, and you know, I think this is more of a of a draft pick for the future. And if he develops like they think they sh that he should, then he can press 
these other guys for playing time, or, or maybe even by the end of the year, be pressing, you know, Jalen Mills to, to actually be a, a, a starter. I mean, you, you also got um, what's the other the other safety they they signed Will in Park. free agent? Will Park. Will Parks. They also got Will Parks. So you know what I see is they've they've created this. They created a bevy of competition, which I think is important to get the best out of all your players. If you create competition, now you the cream always rises to the top and you find out who really wants to play, who wants to be the starter, so on and so forth. Um, but Jalen Mills is going to get every opportunity, you know, to, to, to be the star and safety. Whether he can make that transition or not, that's yet to be seen. And I believe that um, – You've got Sidney Jones, who's in a show and prove it year. And I think you've had a, you have a month of Ante Maddox on the other side. And I think that's going to be an interesting battle for who's going to be the starting corner, the starting corner opposite Darius Slay. Very fair. Very fair. So the last question we got for you, Seth, this one is kind of a, an overarching uh, topic. We got who your favorite picks were. We got some of the head scratchers out of the way. I want to ask you, how do you feel this draft went? Give me, give me a grade. I know, I know this is the, the old cliche about draft grades are, are way too premature. Um, but I, I got to ask you, you know what I mean? Are we going to be looking back at this draft in two, three, four years? Are we going to be looking back at the draft, the, the first virtual draft, the 2020 draft? Are we going to be looking back at it fondly? Give me a grade. Well, I, I will say this, and I'll even go back to um, – to the, the two offensive linemen from, from Auburn. I, I will say this, that, you know, you never know what's inside of the player. I could be as wrong as two left shoes. I doubt it, but I could be, I could be wrong as, as wrong as two left shoes when it comes to, you know, my assessment of some of these players. And, you know, when I'm evaluating and analyzing these players, I'm looking at all the things that they bring to the table. You know, just because I highlight a specific thing doesn't mean that that's a permanent weakness for that player. You know, if that player wants to improve and he, you know, is going to do whatever is necessary to improve, then he can get better. When you look at this overall draft, I think, you know, only time will be able to tell what this turns out to be. I think that Jalen Rager is going to be a good wide receiver. But when you look at, um, um, you know, John Hightower, highly impressive. When you look at Quez Watkins, highly impressive. When you look at the addition of Marquise Goodwin, highly impressive. You know, now you take those four guys and you throw that, throw in Deshaun Jackson, if he can stay healthy, my goodness, we should strike fear all over the field from the wide receiver position. So I think we're set there just as long as these guys develop, just as long as you've got coaches who can move these guys in the right direction so that they can maximize and reach their full potential. Um, I think from the linebacker position, it's a step in the right direction. Um, only time will tell. You know, I never thought that I'd see, you know, the Eagles pick a linebacker so, so quick in the third round, but they saw it as a need. They heard the chatter and they moved and, and they got the guy, you know, then they added another guy, you know, in the sixth round. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's too difficult, James, to say or try to project what three, four years down the road is going to look like because no one ever knows. I mean, listen, Casey Tohill could be the best player out of this draft. <laughs> I mean, you think, think about how crazy that could be. You're, you're laughing, but I'm serious. Yeah, seriously. I, mean, I, I, I give you a case in point, Okay. In 1986, I was drafted in the eighth round. Clyde Simmons was drafted in the ninth round, okay? Keith Byers was a first round. Alonzo Johnson was a first, was a second round. Um, you had a guard from Texas A&M that was drafted in the third round. Um, I mean, you could just go through the list, okay? So now... 30-something uh, years later, if you go and you look at that list and you look at the production of those players that are on that list, you tell me who were the most valuable players that were drafted that year, okay? I won't even say. I'll let you be the judge of that. That's the way it works out when you draft players, you know, because you just can't 
it's almost impossible for you to project what it's going to look like. And the thing that's sad for a lot of guys that get drafted late or undrafted free agents, there's not a whole lot that's expected of you. So you've got to do twice or three times the amount of eye opening of the gurus and the powers that be to get the credit that you deserve where a guy that's drafted in the first or second round, he's just got to be average. And everybody's clapping their hands and talking about what a steal he was in the draft and what a great player he was. It's sad, but that's the reality of it. Very true. I mean, we have so many, uh, so many stars in this league, mega stars that came out of being undrafted free agents. Even mm-hmm. um, I, it's, it really is about the the size of the fight in the dog. Uh, Max, what, what are your overall thoughts of this? What, give me, give me something on this draft. Your overall thoughts. Um, with the big fat F they got for the Jalen Hurts pick, that's going to drag the average down to a heavy C plus. I'll say. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. fair. James, we got. I'm- Every Seth had it right on the head though. Third round and later, A plus. I agree. I mm-hmm. agree. I agree. The the head scratcher of the first, the the bombing of the second, um, you know, kind of negates the the wonderful fourth round or third round and on that the Eagles did. So I'm right around Max. So you know, a C plus. Enough that you know you're gonna get your degree and you're gonna get smiles as you walk across the stage, but a lot of people are gonna look at your transcripts and be like, uh, eh, you could have done a little bit better. Hey Jen, so I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to do the math here for these guys because they both said C plus, and then Max said A plus from the third round on. Um, so if you got A plus, I didn't say A plus on the third round on. I, I said you did well in the third round. Okay, on. well you, you gave me an overall, yeah, so I'm assuming that you're right along the lines with Max. So my thing is, if they did A plus in rounds three through um, seven. Um, and then you take into account, let's say that Jalen Hurts, you know, an F max is a little too harsh. That's a little too harsh. Come on. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll give at you least I, didn't say, I almost said zero at first. At least I'm give, giving him points. Give, give him an F. If, if that's what you choose, I choose not to give him an F. I would say C minus, but if you, okay, give him an F. So then you go to the first pick. Um, you can't go any worse than B. Which I don't. I actually, I don't think I've, I've really had a chance to talk about Rager. I actually, you know, I guess part of it is like, you know, more investigation on him, but I actually really like that pick. I think, you know, he's going to be a great fit for the Eagles. And honestly, I think that that was the guy they always wanted over Justin Jefferson. I think they were happy that they got him. And for me personally, that gives me some confidence that they felt this strongly about this guy where it was a no brainer for them take Ray Grover Jefferson. He was I think doomed he, by poor, uh, poor quarterback play at TCU. He was like, if, if he – God all did have Ray. He did have very bad quarterback. Yeah, so maybe quarterback, me and Max different, though. He would have been – Maybe me and Max do differ a, a little bit, Seth. I'm, I'm not as high on the Jalen Rager pick as Max is, and I'm pretty firm on, you know, Jalen Hurts being a bad second-round pick. I agree with you. Jalen Hurts, the person, and Jalen Hurts, the football player, you can't say enough good things about. But for the Eagles and for that to be their second-round pick – doesn't make really any sense to me. So I can't really give that anything higher than like a D minus or an F because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I can't, I can't justify it. So when you look at those two picks for me and then average it out with, you know, rounds three through, three through seven, you get about a C plus for me. Cusp will be minus, but you get about a C plus. I didn't, I didn't give my, my grade. I'm, I'm going to give him a B. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to give him a B as far as this draft is concerned. Because I feel like Max, I think from the third round on, they they absolutely slayed it. I think they killed it. Um, only time will tell with this Rager kid. I think that, you know, over time we'll figure that out. But the head scratcher for me, and I give him a C minus, you know, maybe even a D plus as far as, you know, Jalen Hurts is concerned, because I just, I can't figure out, I can't figure out where the, where the productivity is going to come from. And you can't lose that kind of that, that productivity in the second round at 53, you know, because it's not, it's, it's not one of those situations where he sits over here, you know, for two years while he learns what he's doing, and then you throw him in and he's productive. If Carson Wentz stays healthy, you're getting zero production out of that position for the next five to ten years. And that's a scary proposition if it's not one of those deals where you take him and you develop him, and where are you gonna where are you gonna showcase him? Right. Where where are you gonna showcase him at? 
Because you've got to showcase them at some point in order for people to see that there's enough value for you to move them and get some trade capital for them. I think you're, I think you're proving our point of, of the F grade. I, I really think you are because in an ideal scenario, in a perfect world, you draft your, your second round draft pick sees the field at some point. And to your point, if everything goes right for the Eagles, you never see the second round draft pick. To me, that constitutes as an F. If I never see my second round draft pick hit the field, I wasted a second round draft pick. What if you? What, but but what if you develop him and say two three years down the road he turns into a one and a two for you? Now what? Then that's, that's a great pick. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good pick. Then I guess that's that, you're right though. Max uh, Max kid didn't really grade on a curve there, and coming from a student who needed a curve, uh, I don't really agree <laughs> with that Max. Uh, but that's, I, I I'm gonna go with what you said. I'm gonna give this draft a, a C plus mainly because the the head scratcher of Jalen Hurts. I don't get it. Um, Rager, I actually really like more than a lot of people. And then just, you, you got it right. They absolutely nailed this uh, second half of the draft. They identified their guys. A lot of guys, a lot of GMs in the past have gotten way too happy with the, the value picks um, instead of just really realizing that once you get to a certain point on that board, you need to go after your guys, your culture, the, the guys you want to put on that field and you think you can develop. Um, so I, I'm going to go – uh, C plus just because of the the head scratcher brings the aggregate down, but I, I think Howie is going to come away with this draft at least being satisfied. Uh, but that was that was our last question for you, uh, sir. That's we really thank you for coming on. I know you actually have started back Great. up with that Joiner podcast. Um, I, I, we got to get that out there. Tell the people where they can find it, what time it's going up, uh, where they can listen to it. All over my social media, man, at Twitter, Seth, at Seth Joyner. I'm on Instagram at Seth Joyner. Uh, I'm on Facebook at Seth Joyner. And um, on my YouTube page, it just got launched a couple of days, at Seth Joyner. And then, um, you know, everything will be housed. Like, you can pick up my podcast, all of that stuff, on SethJoyner.com. Um, starting tomorrow, we're going to be moving to a – a streaming look, but the podcast will still be there. We'll tape and stream, but then we'll transcribe all the um, audio off and translate it to a podcast as well. So, you know, people who are still quarantined, sitting at home that are looking for content, you can find it at SethJoyner.com, at, you know, at YouTube.com, at Seth Joyner at YouTube, or, you know, you can just go to SethJoyner.com, click on the link and listen to the podcast anytime you want to we usually tape on tuesday and the podcast is usually up by you know noon wednesday or early thursday morning that's amazing uh, i i had the pleasure of working with you on uh, our hit em high show and seth i gotta be honest man i've never met anybody with a better mind for the game uh what a truly an eagle great philadelphia great we always appreciate you coming on everything you got for mine in philly uh hopefully We'll get you back soon, and because because we uh, we love talking football with you, man. Um, honestly, so thank you again for coming on. Thank you, sir. Uh, everybody, give a listen to the Seth Joiner podcast. The dude is he's the best in the business right here. So we got to move into halftime, uh, and everybody knows what that means around here. So going with the theme of this pandemic, we're all doing this from our home offices, quote unquote office. Um, but our halftime always comes with social media distancing question uh, where we pit you two guys against each other. We ask you sitting at home, because uh, I know you're sitting at home, uh, the viewer to decide who wins, and then we let you guys in on uh, what they get to do when they lose each week. So th this week, it kind of it's it's going to tie into our uh, weekly last dance breakdown. But in the uh, in the last episode of Last Dance, Scottie Pippen was referred to as Robin to, to Michael Jordan's Batman, which, although I don't personally subscribe to, I think that just feeds into the narrative of him constantly being undervalued during his career. Uh, the what do you question, mean you don't subscribe to that? What would you – you wouldn't call Scotty – you would call him Batman? I, dude, what would you I'm, call I'm, Scotty? I'm calling him, like, like Green, uh, Green Lantern. You know what I mean? Part of the Justice League. Yeah, I, I Part think, of the Justice League. Yeah. But even in, even in the hierarchy of the Justice League, who was number one? Superman. Oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, come on now. Don't, uh, don't fuck around with that. I'm a Marvel guy. I'm a Marvel guy. That's DC. I'm a Marvel All guy. All right, I'll give you that. I'll give you I'll that. The, the, the question still stands. We got to ask you because there has been this dynamic so many times with different players throughout the league. Uh, is Scottie Pippen the best Robin in NBA history? Because we go down the list, and there's quite a few 1A, 1B, 1-2 duos in this league. Uh, James, what do you think? 
Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to say no. And wow. Because I, because I think we're forgetting about someone who at one point, he may not have spent the bulk of his career as Robin, but there is someone who won three championships as Robin, as Robin and then went on to be one of the best players in NBA history. And that's Kobe Bean Bryant. Kobe Bryant spent those first three championships on the Lakers being the number two to Shaq's number one. It's okay to say Shaq was one of the, had them one of the most dominant playoff stretches for those three years. Hmm. Kobe Bryant was the supporting role to that. And I don't think that's slighting Kobe Bryant in any way, and I'm certainly not trying to. But if you look at what Kobe Bryant spent doing those first three championships in L.A., it was – aiding a, a 36 point, points per game, 12 rebound, and a couple blocks per game. Shaq, who ended up getting those three finals MVPs. So for the standpoint of a championship run, I'm going to have to go Scotty is ladder to Kobe Bryant being the best Robin, at least in a championship format in a championship run. Max, what do you got? All right, so let me ask, am I allowed to choose Scotty Pippen? Yeah, you oh, can yeah, say yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, because that's who I want. For all six of them. So as far as I'm concerned, he is the best fit for this question of who is the best Robin in NBA history because he accepted that role unlike Kobe. Kobe never was cool with being in Shaq's shadow. Scotty realized that he was never going to be better than Michael Jordan, even if he was the second, third, or fourth, fifth, whatever you want to call him. But at worst, he was a consensus top 10 player, even with his injuries, right? And I think mm -hmm. him being open and willing and, and realizing that that was, you know, the best role for him and the team – I think that puts him clearly as, you know, the, the, the guy who is, who takes that, that title to me. at least. That's fair. That's fair. I, uh, I don't disagree with either of your picks, um, but I'm gonna drop a little nugget out here and say Dwayne Wade. I was thinking him. I was, was going to go with him if it wasn't I was for thinking. him. I was definitely thinking. I, I was going to go with, I went to... with two different Batmans. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, hey, but no, he, he was Batman at one. I don't think he was robbing the Shaq's Batman. I think I think he wouldn't have been able to win a championship without Shaq, but I mean he got that finals MVP. In that he, final series, he was Batman, but I think throughout that year he was still mostly Robin. Hey, hey, man, I, if, but if, Dwayne, I, to be fair, James, Dwayne Wade is how I settled on Kobe Bryant. My mind went to Dwayne Wade, and then I thought of why, and then when I started thinking of why, I was like, wow, Kobe Bryant really fits that mold too, and that's how I settled on Kobe Bryant. Perfectly fair. So I, as always, guys, number yeah. one, Clay Thompson. Oh, that's also a good up one. there. That's also a good up one. That's 100% up there. 100%. Um, wow, yeah, no, that, that's a that's very good pick out of a hat there, Max. Um, but as always, guys, you guys got to let us know who loses and who wins. Uh, you're going to vote either by leaving comments down below on our Facebook uh, or on our YouTube page, wherever you guys are watching this, or you can go on our Facebook or uh, our Instagram and Twitter, excuse me, our Instagram and Twitter pages, and they're going to have polls up there. You guys let us know whether you're going with Max, who's riding with Scotty as Robin, or JJ, who's uh, picking the unlikely Kobe Bean Bryant as Robin. So that's going to that's gonna wrap up our social media distancing question. Again, don't get to vote because you don't want to miss out on what's going to happen. So we are here with the one and only Adam Kaplan, uh, so well-respected around the league. We are honestly – this is a pleasure to have you on. I know you're so busy around this time of year just because, honestly, your opinion is greatly valued. So – I got to get right into it and just give me your overall sense of how this draft went and how this, like what direction this tells us that Howie is looking in this draft. Yeah. Assuming you're talking about the Eagles. So yeah. yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I, I would say that this is a draft where they were going to get younger. They were going to get more athletic. They did that. Uh, there's no question. That's what they, that's what their plan was. My, my broadcast partner and I, Jeff Mosher and our show inside the birds, we told people what was going to happen mm -hmm. and it happened, but I didn't think it would quite happen like it did in the second round. That was right. – seriously, I was shocked. Oh, okay. uh, Adam, I, I, I will get to that. I yeah, will get yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is they got faster because we had said on our show last fall, incredibly slow on both sides of the football. Uh, I thought they hurt Carson Wentz's development by not having speed. If Deshaun Jackson gets hurt, Alshon Jeffrey, who didn't really run that well before he got hurt, he looks like he's a fading player at 30 years old. He just didn't have any speed. So now they've got speed. Uh, these guys have to develop. You just don't know when they're going to be ready, but you, you can't knock them for addressing a major need on both sides of the football. Mm -hmm. right. Max, I know you had a question. What, uh, what do you want to ask Mr. Kaplan? I want to hear your opinion about Jalen Rager. It seems like you're maybe more on the onboard side of things compared to most people that just know Justin Jefferson is the name. Yeah, I did a lot of work on him for the draft. I had a pretty good idea that that's where the direction they were going to go based on where they were going uh, at 21. 
had they been picking further ahead, then they might have looked at a different player. But what I did know is he's one of the top three speed receivers for this draft. And if they didn't get a speed receiver in this draft, whether it be Rager, uh, K.J. Hamler who went to Denver in the second round, uh, or somebody else, this was not going to be a good draft for them at receiver if they didn't get anyone who can run. And to me, uh, that was the key for them, and they got it. R- Rager's a do- really physically talented player. He might not be 6'2", but he's physical, he's tough, he's fast as hell. Uh, he's, he's very competitive. This is the kind of guy that you want to build your team with. This was a – we could talk all we want about the mock drafters putting him in the second round. They just don't know – they haven't talked to anyone that works in the National Football League. I do for a living. Uh, he was supposed to go, as I put on Twitter before the draft, I gave him the range of 19 to 31. That is the range that I got from other teams. Wow. So that's where he's at. Uh, they didn't reach at all. This is exactly where he should have gone. Uh, I, that pick they're going to get right. I'll go – you guys didn't play at a game yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on record saying they're going to get that one right. Wow. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I just know the player. I did a lot of work on him. I did a lot of work on Justin Jefferson, who you mentioned. Jefferson does not fit what they want to do. I kind of outlined that. If you listen to my show with Jeff, on our show, I basically laid it out. He does, it's not where they're going to go. They already have Greg Ward. Jefferson's a better football player, but they need someone who can play on the outside. The belief around the league is with, with Justin Jefferson is he'll do great in the slot. On the outside, he may struggle to win consistently. That's the way the Eagles saw it. That's the way a lot of other teams saw it. But uh, the Vikings didn't. Uh, they liked Jefferson and Rager and, and Ayuk, and uh, they went with Jefferson. And I feel like to personally, I feel like we would have seen Rager go way higher if he wasn't just doomed with poor quarterback play at TCU. Correct. You're right. Um, You're right. It's, right. It really is a shame because the, I mean, it's not a shame for the Eagles, but the kid lost out on a couple million dollars because the guy slinging him the rock couldn't, could it get it there? Couldn't get it to him. That's all right. When he gets to his second contract, he'll do fine. Exactly. Do exactly. And, uh, James, and, I know you've been I, ask something too. I've been, I've been dying to, been dying to ask this. Adam, right. we, we just talked with uh, former Eagles legend Seth Joyner, and we asked him a very specific question to which he couldn't find an adequate answer to. And, I, and I'm wondering if anybody can. The Eagles picked Jalen Hurts with the 53rd overall pick, their second round pick. Adam, make it – it's a two-part question. The first part is – Make it make sense to me. No one, no one knows why. Make that pick make sense to me and, the, yeah. and all the Philadelphia Eagles fans watching. Please. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I was in shock. Um, I'm really, really surprised during a draft pick. And oh, when I saw it, point. yeah, when, when I saw it, guys, I, I looked at the screen. I'm like, what? You know, it was kind of like, <laughs> exactly. I don't get it. Uh, you know, I did check into it. it. It makes more sense to me now. But still, the way it works in the National Football League is you don't take backup players in the second round. That's just the way it works. Yeah. Now. The Eagles have more plans for him to be, we're talking about Hurts here, that more than a backup quarterback, obviously. You, you, don't, you just don't take a backup quarterback in the second round. Because he's got so much athleticism, you're going to see him lined up at various positions over the next two or three years. I don't know when he's going to be ready to be the number two quarterback. I would say their hope is by year two. Year one, I just don't see it. Uh, Nate Sudfeld should be that guy. They had interest, as I reported a month ago, in Joe Flacco. Uh, probably would have signed him, but physically he's just not ready. Uh, but getting back to Jalen Hurts, he's got a lot of ability, uh, super athletic. Uh, you can, you're going to probably move him around until, until he's ready to be the number two quarterback. You got to figure out a way to use him and get him on the field. Could be a red zone package, could be a third down package, short yardage. Doug Peterson is such a good play caller. I'm not worried about those type, that type of usage, but long term, he's got to be the backup quarterback. But are you paying to be that that guy? Or did you draft him? I know it was a low second round pick. I understand that. Uh, I would have preferred, from an Eagles standpoint, they got him in a third round. But they were not going to take a chance because they had plans for this guy and, and not getting him because when you get into the third round, anything goes. Second round, your, your grades are higher. Third round, it could be anything. And they were not going to wait till at the end of the third round to take a risk. I, I get that part of it. But it's still very curious because – the fact of the matter is how much is he really good on the field in the next two or three years as a second round pick? And, and, you're, and you're confident, and that's why the Eagles picked them. They picked them to be more than a second – or to more than a backup quarterback. They're using him in the utility, and I'm, I'm using Howard Roseman's words here, the Taysom Hill role that we see the Saints use. You're confident, and that's why the Eagles picked them. A little them. bit. Yeah, Doug Peterson said that. When I, as, soon as, the, as soon as the pick was made, two minutes later, I said, I don't know. I haven't even talked to them yet. My first, my first thing is it's a Taysom Hill type role. A hybrid role. Yeah, he's going to be a quarterback first. Doug Peterson made that very clear, and I, I, I get it. But you need to get value out of the player. And, by the way, he offers so much more than being a quarterback. 
uh, as Lamar Jackson did as a rookie. They had, and, and you guys weren't alive then, but when Randall Cunningham was a rookie in 86, I remember Ron Jaworski telling me, and it bothered him because they would take him off the field, but they would use Randall Cunningham in a specific role on third down as sort of a playmaker. Now, mm-hmm. things are more sophisticated now. They actually have a, you actually have a game plan for a player back when they, Buddy Ryan was the coach. Uh, they didn't have a plan for Randall. They just want to get him on the field. It, just, it, it didn't work real well because it wasn't really structured. Right. Plays are structured now. So whenever they use Hurts on the field, he's definitely going to be used in a, in a way that they're going to get something out of him. Okay, okay. And finally, those were two follow-up questions to my first. Finally, the second part of my question is, we've heard the reports and, and the clamoring from the, the, the Eagles peanut gallery, but what are you hearing <laughs> from, from the rest of the league? What, what was the reaction from all other 31 teams in the NFL, executive coaches, fans? What did you hear out there? Un- unconventional from personal people. I got texts. I didn't even have to ask for them. Weird, <laughs> different, uh, don't get it. Uh, what have you heard? And I was like, I didn't hear anything. This so just no happened. I wasn't expecting it. it. No one got it. No, 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 no because you're it. so what, like covered. This is my 21st draft. When Tim Tebow was taken by the Broncos, I was actually at in New York for that draft. I was shocked by it. Uh, when things happen that you're not expecting, you just have to go for Look, I was in the press box when the Eagles had an agreement with Michael Vick. It just happened to be Tom Brady's return from his ACL injury, ACL injury against the Patriots. It was a preseason game. We didn't know it was coming, so you're like, what? Like, you, you, you right. don't you, – you sort of try to process it. And I'm sure you guys sitting there and, you're, and your fans watching your show are like, what the hell are they doing? Like, what are they I, thinking? I laughed. I got a good laugh on I, I just – I was just like, I don't get it. And I, I have a better understanding of it now. And I, I'm, I'm someone who will not judge a draft until at least three years have gone. Unless the guy, unless the guy clearly is a, not going to play where they just admit that they got it wrong or they cut him or trade him. Like, you, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember J. Quan Jarrett. Oh, yeah. Who's the second round oh, pick Temple from guy. Temple. Oh, See cool. the Temple banner? Love it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so he was a, two, he was a second round pick in 2011. The Eagles realized that their mistake. Uh, he got cut during the, the, his second training camp, which is obviously an off, you know, they, they, they sucked it up. They admitted their mistake. Instead of belaboring it, they drafted a box player. You can't draft a safety who can't cover. Right. That, this is not 1970 or 80 where you could you have a strong safety in the box and a free safety in the back. That's not the way it works anymore. So I think what happened there is the Eagles learned a lesson. And we'll see with this kid. I, I, it was a surprise. And, and, and um, he's a great kid, by the way. Let, let, let's right. let it play out. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be fun, though. I promise you this much. Watching this kid over the next year, year and a half, is going to be interesting. Whenever he comes on the field, it's going to be exciting. I, I agree. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, Mr. Kaplan. I was watching my phone for like an hour or like half an hour after the draft, <laughs> just waiting for a trade as in like, oh, they took them because another team wanted them. They're, they're flipping them. They're doing – Oh, oh, no, like the NBA, no. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that's an NBA I, thing. That's not an NFL no, thing. No, it wasn't, man. It wasn't. Yeah. Um, but we, I got one more question for you really quick. Sure. You, know, you got to go. Um, I, I'm really interested because you're so plugged in in this league. I really want to know your top five drafts from around the league, what you've seen uh, and, and just where other teams are going. Yeah, off the top of my head, just from talking to other teams I've kind of looked at, I thought the Browns and Andrew Berry, former Eagles executive, he had a great first draft. Uh, so did Joe Douglas. Uh, Joe in his first full season, this is his first draft, first free agency. I thought he did a great job. Uh, I grew up here, and it pains me to say it. I'm not a fan of any team anymore. I can't be, being a reporter, being mm-hmm. objective. But it pains me to say this because I have so many friends who are Eagles season ticket holders. But I think the Cowboys had the best draft. I thought they were phenomenal. Uh, just, just incredibly, they did a good job. I still think the Eagles are the favorite for the NFC East before they even play a game. But man, if these draft picks pan out, uh, they address so many needs. The yeah, CD Lamp pick yeah. fell in their lap. I mean, they did a good job. You got to give it up to them. Uh, I got a question since I'm a I'm a biased fan, and obviously this is how it seems to me. But it seems to me that the Cowboys just had players that were unquestionably the best pick for them fall in their laps through the first four rounds. Sometimes it happens. It's like fantasy football. Like you're okay. like, man, I'm not going to trade out. It went right to me. You know. Thank you, thank you for confirming me that I'm not maybe as biased as I thought. Max, but well, Max, here's the thing: you don't have to like you, you're doing that because you want to try to take some credit from the Cowboys. They didn't they didn't draft really well. They just happened to have players to fall to their left. <laughs> no, but, but you got to take them. But though. you, you got to take, take them. Thank you, Adam. But you but the other part of that is you have to take them. There's so many teams we see right. botch picks. The Eagles took a backup quarterback 53. Like, you can botch picks really easily. So yes. That those picks happen to fall to them, but give the Cowboys credit and give Jerry credit for not over outsmarting himself, not overthinking and going grabbing the low hanging fruit. It's right there. Right, you I take them, take them. Hey, hey, by the way, guys, are you, you guys go go to school together. So how how do you guys know each other? 
uh, just all, all, all through, through the same to be in, in sports media, media and yeah. you know working with uh, working with this media production company, my new Philly, one of the cool. fastest cool. And, you know you know fastest growing media production companies in the city. So nice. I'll let the banner fool you. I'm I'm out. I've been out of school for a couple of years. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, we're both we're both Temple grads. Uh, Max awesome. Go no Rams, Westchester grad. That's, no, that's yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah. Adam. We it's a good really, spot to live. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's a good area. West Church is a really nice area. Love yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Adam, we, we really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you coming Thanks, on. Sir. Know you have so many people clamoring for your time around this, uh, this time of year. Draft creates so much content. Uh, like you said before, uh, your show with Jeff Mosher, Inside the Birds. Everybody go check that out. Adam and Jeff do a, a wonderful job breaking awesome. out everything birds. Um, check that out. So, Adam, seriously, thank you for coming on to Trust the Process. Thank you so Adam. much. The, thank uh, you so much, sir. Talk to you soon. All right, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So much. See you guys. So, I, guys, I continue to be blown away with, um, one, I don't necessarily think Michael Jordan needed to do this whole last dance thing, but I'm pleasantly surprised that he did because it's being done extremely it's well. Phenomenal. Um, it's, phenomenal. it's being done extremely well. I mean, ESPN's always had a long track record of just killing the documentary game with 30 for 30. I, I still will just turn on 30 for 30, for 30 docs whenever I'm just bored and looking for cool content. Um, but – I, I, I'm just, I'm so pleasantly surprised. So we wrapped up episodes one and two last week. This week, um, I was extremely looking forward to because the two episodes they chose for this week were Dennis Rodman and Phil Jackson, two of the most divisive people uh, probably ever. Um, Phil Jackson as, as a coach, um, even back to his playing days, he was more of a hippie in the, uh, in the conventional NBA. And then just, Dennis Rodman, man. Um, guy, <laughs> you don't got to say anything. So Absolutely. He really is one of the most polarizing people to ever walk this planet. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, ESPN also did a great documentary um, about Dennis Rodman that digs uh, a little bit deeper into him as a person and even goes all the way up to um, these past couple of years when he actually went to North Korea, all of that backlash, his, his – personal relationships with his daughter, his ex-wives. Uh, I say wives, who, because why would you ever get divorced to Carmen Electra? Um, but I'll digress. Uh, that's not what we're here for. Um, so we're going to talk about, we'll start with three and we'll go to four. Um, uh, let's see. So the first one is kind of, it's kind of self-explanatory, but was the Bulls, or, Bulls win over the Piston their most important series win? I say self-explanatory because there's always that hump that you need to get over that, that kind of. That's exactly why. That, right. That's exactly why. Was not their most, I, I think most impressive and most important are two different. I right. still don't think it's their most impressive series win. It's up there, but I mean, after failing three times and then finally winning, I don't think it goes as your, your most impressive, but it was your most important. It was, and you, you heard Isaiah Thomas talk about it last night and this morning as he appeared on first take uh, on, on Monday morning. You, you heard John Sally talk about it. You heard so many people talk about it. To get to where they were, they needed to beat the bad boy Pistons. They would not have been able to be the, the Chicago Bulls that we know today without getting over that Pistons team. It's not eventually beating the Pistons, not beating the Pistons in, you know, mid-90s when they're old and they're done their run. Beating that same Pistons team that has bullied you for so many years and finally getting over that, now no one scares you. Like, once they were able to get past the Pistons, once Scottie Pippen showed that moment of, you know, Bill Lambeer slinging him to the ground and he's not going to retaliate, you no longer have that influence over me. There's no one who scares you. There's no juggernaut in the NBA that we can't get past because we just beat the bad boy Pistons. And so I think from that standpoint, yes, by and far and in large, that's the most important series win. It took them from being – the Chicago Bulls to being the Chicago Bulls that everyone feared. Max, what do you got? Uh, I mean, it's pretty hard to disagree. I guess the only thing you can really say to, to maybe make a case for uh, a different a different series, I think, would maybe just be that final series against the Lakers. Um, they Getting over that one hump is always, you know, it's, it's, it's that relief moment that they look back on after the dynasty. But what happens if you're so mentally drained from – getting over the Pistons, you know, even though it was only a four game series, right. That still is a big mental toll to, you know, a letdown against the Lakers who are, you know, 
X, X amount of time finals appearances at that point with Magic Johnson. I, mean, I can't even remember if it was, you know, seven or eight at that point by 91. I mean, and at that point, that's why I don't even think it's really that important in the grand scheme of things. It was Magic Johnson's last year. Kareem was hurt, wasn't even playing in the series. And at that point, he had five rings on the finger. Like, and, and Magic had already accepted, even going into next summer, going on the Dream Team with Michael Jordan, he had already accepted that my time is over. This is Michael's. I mean, he wasn't even upset after losing. He was like, if I had to lose yeah, to anyone, I'd lose to Michael Jordan. Like, it's not – like, Magic had accepted. It's his time. Glad, I'm, I'm glad for the young fellow. I'm leaving anyway. Like he said, yeah, I, I'm not – I think it goes without question saying that the Pistons series is the, is the big one. But – just think about how the dynamic of that franchise and their mindset changes if they can't beat that Lakers team That's who's true. on its last. That's very true. That's all you got? I want to hear more from you, Max. Uh, I, I got I, nothing, I, man. Those, those, they, oh, that was nice. those guys. That's, that's the only team they cared about winning. They, yeah. they cared about beating. They specifically built that team and trained that team to beat to the beat Pistons. Pistons. That's, I, I'm, and that's exactly why I'm going to agree with you because, I mean, you saw it. The difference between Michael Jordan, the, the offseason when they lost to the, the, to the Pistons, between when he came back, he literally had that whole team in the gym. You could see Michael Jordan. He was like 20 literally. pounds heavier. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was a body. Like, it, it was a literally different body. Like, and, and the trainers kept saying, like, I, I would give him a number of reps to do, and he'd always do five or six more. Like, Jordan literally, he transformed his body. And I think that that translates deep down the road because even LeBron has came out and said, with how many trips to the finals he's gone – it really takes a toll on your body. And if you're not ready for that, there could not have been this sustain, the, the uh, sustained success that this franchise had. And we're talking about the greatest teams of all time. You don't like, you can't play for that long, like that much of a year and not have that come back on you. So like that, that for, for the bad boys to really push them to the point where Michael Jordan, the greatest competitor of all time still realized he had more work to do. Like that's, that's incredible. Um, I mean, you heard, you heard John Sally say it. The sheer fact that Michael Jordan got up every single time right. is what gained their respect. He was like, I don't think there's another person I could have played against that could have taken that kind of beating and got up off the floor every single time. No, like yeah, that no. in itself. Uh, so this, he needed to transform his body because of the absolute punishment that he was taking. Um, and and the, the Detroit Pistons are widely considered – um, th those Detroit Pistons are widely considered one of the best defensive teams of all time. Now, not a lot of people will call them the most, the most technically sound defense, but nobody scored on them because you did not want to go into that paint and face Bill Lambeer, ja, John Sally, um, uh, God. Rick Mahorn. Rick Mahorn. Uh, Mahorn literally punished. He punched so many people in the face. Like he, uh, <laughs> that, that playoff series against the Bulls. John Sally said it. The, the Pistons didn't get in a fight with the Bulls. Rick Mahorn fought the entire Bulls team. Um, so that just tells you what kind of defense they played. But that kind of begs the question, would you like to see that kind of defense in the league today? Look, here's what I'll say. No, I don't want to see that kind of – that's not defense. I don't want to see that. I don't like – who wants to see your best player get choked midair and slammed to the ground? I mean, not just Michael – see, not just Michael Jordan. They did it to Larry Bird. Um, you know, they did it to Reggie Miller. I mean, they, they're just that, – that's what they did. Like, that, that's the, the type of style that they played. But that's not defense. That's just tackling people and putting them to the ground. So, if you want to call that what it is, then sure. Then that, that, that'd be cool. But that's not what I want to see in today's NBA. I do want to see the mindset, though. I do want to see the mindset of this bucket is not easy. They, they – the scheme of the Jordan rules was more complex than just put him to the ground. When he's in the air, then yes, we just put him to the ground. Their offense or their defensive strategy for Michael Jordan was he, when he is on the ground, before he takes flight, he is guardable. Once he takes flight, he's not human. So get him while he's on the ground. 
When he gets the ball, we trap him. We move him. He goes baseline the best. We take baseline away from him. We put him in the body so he sees people. That's what I want to see. I want to see that kind of overly defensive strategy get used in the NBA. And I really think there's only one team who does it right now, and that's the Milwaukee Bucks, who really put that much emphasis onto the defensive end and said, if we can't outscore you, we're going to make sure you score less than us. And it's a priority. It's a focal point. The Pistons made that a focal point, albeit much too physically. And that's where they went wrong. But the mindset of take Jordan's powers away and what's the best way to do that, that's what I want to see in today's NBA. That's what I think is okay from the situation. Max, you want to see people getting forearm shipped or what? <laughs> um, not, not necessarily to that level where it's like straight up street fighting in some cases. Uh, <laughs> I will say this, the, the age old discussion, I think we really need to talk about how much more lax the NBA refereeing was because a lot of those fouls that the Pistons, you know, committed, most of those are getting you kicked out of the game on the spot. Uh, you're getting suspended. Right. You're getting yeah. suspended and multiple I think really that's the main difference. Like, I think that teams did play maybe a little bit more tougher defense in general, but then they could also get bailed out by literally elbowing somebody in the throat in midair and the rest would be like, you know, it's a basic two-shot foul. So I mm -hmm. think there's a little bit of give and pull there. I'll say I would like – you know, maybe the, the whistles to, I don't want to say be silent because you still got to call the game, uh, you know, properly and consistently. But I think the way that the league has started to become over the last couple of years where a lot more like natural acts of basketball, like clear just plays for the ball that have gone awry, like, you know, someone catching a, a hand to the face or, or something, you know, that's maybe a little bit harder than a common foul. But like, that doesn't need to be a flagrant or a tech. Like that can still just be, a hard common foul. I think that's something that's really not not a but, but look, but but look, the NBA is different from any other league, right? They are so proactive, and they saw like the concussion movement that was happening, and saying hits to the head can no longer be taken lightly, and we're not going to get sued ten years down the road because a guy took an elbow in the back of the head, and we didn't call it, and now he's suffering later down the road. So I think they've adapted because of that. But I'd much rather see my favorite player play twenty years in the league and have all this success because he's preserved by the play calling and by the fouls, then I would like to see my favorite player have a, a seven, eight year career with minimal success because he plays in a, in a rougher, tougher NBA. I'd oh, much I totally rather agree. see longevity. I'd much rather see longevity. I'm in a tricky situation here. I, I definitely agree with you. I I'm over players careers getting cut short. I don't think anybody will ever disagree with that. Um, but I'm going to agree with you, James. The, the, the mindset is really what I want to see, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that I'm really missing. Because too many players now come into the league and just think, oh, I can coast on natural ability. I don't have to have the absolute drive. Actually, what Seth Joyner was talking about uh, earlier, you, you, unless it's a pit bull puppy, you can't buy a puppy and teach him to become a pit bull. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like it's, it's one of those things where, oh, it's a little bit too hard, it's a, it's a tough defense, I'm not going to get mine today, so I'm, I'm going to pass out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the easy road. Uh, too many kids coming into the league like that, you know what I mean? Even, even with me wanting to see more out of Ben Simmons, uh, more along that line, you know what I mean? Just the, the I need to do this because there's this in my way. I need to get over this specific team. Um, that's – Kind of what sure. I it stretches to more than just defense. It stretches yeah. to more than just defense. Like, exactly. Right? That, that, and I think that's a good point. I think it's – I think I'll agree with you guys and say that I don't want to necessarily want to see this defense. I want to see that mindset. I want to see that toughness, that, uh, that internal, that heart. You know what I mean? Um, and our last question, um, even though I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about Phil Jackson, guys, uh, but I guess we can leave that for another time because he's honestly a really fun character to talk about because, honestly, he just – Phil Jackson to me seems like a caricature, like something you would get off like the boardwalk. Just that. yeah, the way he carries himself. He's stuff. enormous, dude. I never realized how tall he is. I mean, oh he my played, God, man. played like, center I, in the NBA. He, <laughs> he won championships with the Knicks. Like the dude, he, two championships with the Knicks. Right, <laughs> before he won as a coach. Um, I, I just I found it hilarious. Like Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman doing um Native American. Yoga like quote unquote yoga like on a basketball court like this dude phil jackson's out there in a polo like a tucked in polo and jeans like leading a yoga class like that uh, that's wild like he wrote a book yeah it was very 90s that he scene. wrote a book talking about how he did acid and yet still got a job like that it's it's the 90s man 
the, the 90s. And, uh, so much of this stuff wouldn't fly. And talking about things that wouldn't <laughs> fly, talking about things that wouldn't fly, um, can I just say Dennis Rodman wouldn't fly anymore? Um, uh, no, oh, but, Dennis Rodman would not fly. Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Rodman, Rodman wouldn't fly. But, actually, in today's age of embracing your natural self yeah. and who you Stop are, it. Stop it. I don't know, man. Dennis Stop Rodman it. would have a huge fan club today. Dennis Rodman would have. He would have a huge fan club, but it wouldn't fly. Uh, and <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that wouldn't fly the most about Dennis Rodman is him straight up telling Michael Jordan and Phil Jackson, I need a vacation. So he goes off to Vegas and is given 48 hours to go get it out of his system. And lo and behold, he doesn't come back in 48 hours. So play, play this out for me in, in 2020. Play this out for me Hope in real time. Now, you, can, you can take it the way as bring Dennis Rodman to 2020 and he goes off to Vegas or the way that it's 2020 and Matisse uh, – no, Matisse is a bad example. Ben Simmons goes to Brett Brown and says – I'm going to Vegas for 48 hours. I need a vacation. Max, pl- play oh, this man. out. Oh, man. In Philly? In Philly? I, uh, I don't know, man. Ma- Max, play, play this out for me, dude. 2020, I need a vacation. I'm going to Vegas. Um, honestly, I think Dennis – if Dennis Rodman did the vacation thing in current day NBA, it would sh- – like, can you imagine all the videos and just everything that would come out of this? He'd like, bite himself. <laughs> it would be – it would be literally Dennis Robin watch. Like it would just be all the whole world would be paying attention to him because of the way we can connect to each other now. And which is like the most ironic thing about it is that he was trying to get away from all of that. Like he was trying to just like go out and let loose and party and everything. Like I'm sure he still would have had no issues doing that in 2020, but it's kind of just ironic to me that the whole point of him taking this vacation was to clear his mind. And I don't think it would be any easier for him to clear his mind if he has to work about the mob following him everywhere and his every move being under a microscope, even more so than it already is to his employers, because they literally have hundreds of upon thousands of undercover agents working for them that don't even realize it. That's wild. Uh, James, 2020, somebody tell you're the coach. Somebody tells you they're going to Vegas for a vacation. You play with it. Here, here's what I, it won't happen. And, and here's why I say in today's day and age, it won't happen. Two words, per sources. Max just listed out a whole bunch of reasons as to what would happen if Dennis Rodman went. It would be a circus. It would be a, a media brigade. People would be paying attention to Dennis Rodman more than the Bulls. Hell, there'd probably be a hashtag. Hashtag Rodman watch. Hashtag Rodman party. Hashtag Literally. Dennis the Menace. Something would be there. And because of all of that, the bull's hand would be forced from an organizational standpoint to not let him do it. They would be pressured by everybody outside. First of all, the bulls wouldn't get to be the organization who disperses that information. They had that luxury back then of going into a room with three people telling him that, and then on their own merit, telling who they want to tell and dispersing that to the media. I don't, that doesn't happen today. Today, somehow, you know, some, you know, Woj will get a text from someone inside of the Bulls organization that says, not even that he's asked, Dennis Rodman wants to take a vacation. He's stated he wants to get away. But Twitter might know before Jerry Krause knows. Like, that's, that's how information gets dispersed today. And because Literally. of that, you would have Twitter GMs putting their input in before the actual GM would. And you would have all this speculation of it already. People would have to try to sense make. And because of the circus and the media frenzy it would create prior to it, they wouldn't be able to get out ahead. So I think they'd say, Dennis, look at what it's causing already. We're in the middle of a title run. Plus, we have Scotty who's unhappy with us. Phil, we have to find a coaching replacement for Phil Jackson right now. Like, there's too many things happening in our organization right now for us to take on this added responsibility of you and going getting hammered with Carmen Electra just because you want to. Like, that, that we can't afford for that to happen to our organization right now. Like, it's just, there's just, there's too many snakes in the grass in 2020. I'm going to just say it. Like, there's, there's too many leak, too much leakage, you know, too, too many ways that could go awry before the Bulls could really, you know, get their, get their, grasp on it and and control the narrative before it gets out yeah i mean there there would be so many people all over this before dennis Rodman even hits the airport that's uh, what i'm saying like and and then there was that footage of him 
getting off the plane, going to the parking lot, crushing a Miller Lite, and hops on a motorcycle. Like, in, that doesn't fly. Are you talking – as soon as that – first of all, you're right. When going to the Chicago airport, there's thousands of people. Even if they don't know why Dennis Rodman's there, there are people at the airport being like, oh, snap, the Bulls play tomorrow night in Chicago. Why is Dennis Rodman at the Chicago airport? Picture. Once that happens – now, 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 you know, now, now it's a slippery slope. Now we cannot control, you know, what goes on. So I, I truly don't think that in today's landscape, he either wouldn't be allowed to go, or if he truly made that much of a clamoring of it and said, I'm going, he'd get cut. Yeah. Um, that, that's, yeah. I mean, again, this, this is all brought upon by the, the documentary, The Last Dance, uh, that Michael Jordan is uh, putting out there, giving us all really just, the nitty gritty of the best team of all time um, that none of us ever thought we would see. I never really expected to get this kind of information. Not, about this, candid. Not this candid. Not I, this I candid. never, I never expected to hear this type of, of dirty information. Like I won't call it the dirty might be a little bit too much of a stretch, but like this type of just intimate information Unfiltered. about these Unfiltered, yeah. players, like I, it's, it's, it's incredible. So again, we're, we're only through two of the five weeks, guys. Uh, we've got so many more episodes. I know, buckle, buckle up, man. Uh, like it's, uh, and honestly, guys, I, I thought I was excited for the Robin episode and it, it didn't. I know, I'm so happy. Uh, it did not disappoint, but I'm really, th- this Kobe episode that's coming up is. We, we, I'm going to need a shoulder to cry on after the Kobe episode. It, I, it's going to break the internet, man. That's um, crazy. That's just crazy. how many players in the league right now idolize Kobe. Um, and with everything that's happening, uh, rest in peace, the great Kobe Bryant, um, everything that's happened recently, like this is, this is going to break the, this is going to break the internet, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's crazy that, I mean, this documentary was, was made, it was finished at the end of last year, slated to, to be, you know, played in January or in June. So the fact that they already had a Kobe episode built in before the tragedy just shows how much one of an influence Michael Jordan was to Kobe and two, how much respect Michael Jordan has for Kobe to dedicate an entire episode of his 10 part documentary to him. Right. Like, that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the last dance for, for another three weeks, uh, streaming live on ESPN um, at nine o'clock on Sundays. So nine to 11, I know, I know where I'll be. I'm going to be parked in front of a screen um, for the next three weeks. Popcorn, popcorn pop. Yeah. Sorry, want? everybody who needs me, but th- this is cool. something that doesn't happen. Uh, never happened before, and I'm going to take full advantage of it. Uh, but that's going to that's gonna wrap up our, our breakdown of The Last Dance. Uh, catch us next week. We're going to talk episodes five and six. I personally can't wait. Um, but, yeah, let's uh, we're going to wrap this show up with tap outs. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Mine's very brief. Eagles fans, you wasted a second-round pick this year, but it's okay. I empathize. In 2016, the Buccaneers traded up to get Roberto Aguayo, a kicker, in the second round with, I believe it was the 40 something pick high second round pick, ladies and gentlemen, we traded three draft picks to that year and one of the next for a kicker. So, Hey, I get it. It happens. Just, you got to sometimes live with a mistake and move on. But I'm this is the one time where I'm in your corner. I get it. You have my sympathy. We've been there before. Beautiful. Max, what you got? Um, honestly, this hair on my head has become absolutely unbearable. I've been trying my best to hold out for a proper haircut, but I caved today. I ordered myself a new electric razor because the one that I have at my house currently is broken. Uh, actually, I actually don't have the charger for it and it's dead, so it's useless. Um, so more than likely, the next time we all see each other, I, uh, I won't have a full dead animal on top of my head. How are you getting this haircut? Right on. Hey, I might just throw a bowl on top of my head and take scissors, you know what I mean? So you, you might turn out better than I'm me, just... honestly. Um, I'm going to say but... um, this whole pandemic has kind of is, is rocked everything. Um, but I'm it, over it. It's, it's so stay true. strong, everybody out there who's watching. Um, it's not going to last forever. It's not. We get, we get good news each and every day. Uh, so many people are – uh, putting their time and effort to provide meals and masks and PPE equipment and everything. Uh, just the amount of outpouring and effort that people all around the globe are putting in to, to help people on the front lines uh, combat this whole COVID-19 issue is crazy. And I mean, um, 
it seems like they're, I, I think it was Columbia put out earlier today that they're, they're pushing forward in uh, tests with vaccines because uh, they've had um, very good responses with monkeys. So uh, again, the, the end could literally be right around the corner. Um, it's not the end of the world. All we're being asked to do is stay inside. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a brain teaser. It's not something to protest against. We have so many things at our, uh, at our fingertips, streaming services, the internet, uh, smartphones, everything. It's, it's, not that, it's not that hard. Stay inside and let people who are gonna fix this, fix this. And hopefully we can come back to, to broadcasting to you guys live instead of doing this from our home offices. Um, but you know, that's, that's gonna do it for us this week on uh, Trust the Process Live. We had a fantastic time talking with uh, our, the Eagles. A tremendous uh, show. Exalted Eagles set joiner, friend of the program, uh, hit them high uh, the whole episode, or whole season. You can find on my new Phillies Facebook or YouTube channel. Um, and then don't forget to go check out his podcast, the set joiner podcast. Uh, everything is by his namesake, set joiner, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and his uh, website. And then Adam Kaplan, uh, huge shout out to him for joining us as well. The dude is one of the most well plugged in people and most respected people around the league. He offers some absolutely amazing insight uh, each and every week with his partner, Jeff Mozart, um, on Inside the Birds. They, again, do a wonderful job. Go check that out, Inside the Birds, on uh, all social media platforms. We give a huge thank to those guys for coming and stopping by with us. Uh, we, it was a pleasure. Both fantastic dudes. Um, but that, that's going to be it for us, everybody, on uh, Trust the Process Live, brought to you by My New Philly, where something's always new and everything's always everything's Philly. Everything's always Philly. You can catch us next week, uh, same time, same place. Man, that Jalen Hurts pick hurts. <laughs>